We live in toxic times, but we don't have to live in toxic bodies. This presentation will discuss the kinds of toxins we humans have been exposed to, both historically and currently, the way in which the body deals with these toxins, and what we can do to support the detoxification process. Pre-industrial men and women had very little to worry about in terms of toxic exposure. The kinds of toxins they might have encountered were limited to the smoke from a cook fire, the occasional poisonous plants and mushrooms that might find their way into the soup pot, the toxins found in moldy foods, and heavy metals like lead and mercury found in well and river water. The name of the detoxification system that handles these types of poisons is called the glutathione conjugation pathway, and for pre-industrial man, this was all that was needed. Modern men and women have these same types of toxins to deal with, but both the manner in which we are exposed to them, as well as the amounts we are exposed to, have changed. Let's look first at smoke. Our troubles began in the 1800s with the widespread use of coal as an energy source for homes, factories, transportation, and the production of electricity. In London, infamous black fogs from burning coal would last for days, darkening both the faces of the buildings and the lungs of their inhabitants. Many of the citizens of London and other newly industrialized cities became sick and died. In time, legislation was passed putting coal-burning plants farther away from residential sectors, but this was only a short-term solution. There is, after all, only one planetary atmosphere, and as more and more countries became industrialized, the smoke from burning coal became a worldwide problem. Add to the air the exhaust expelled from the now nearly 600 million vehicles on the world's roads, and you can see that the smoke problem has only increased. In some cities like Los Angeles and Mexico City, daily smog reports are given in the newspapers and radio stations, letting people know how safe it is to go outside and breathe the air. Comparing photos of the atmosphere over the last 20 years, Meteorologists have been able to document a significant darkening of our skies. A thick cloud of toxic air has settled over the planet, and while it is worse in some areas than others, the atmospheric changes are evident from pole to pole. Add to this the fact that some of us breathe smoke directly into our lungs from cigarettes, and the problem is only compounded. Our glutathione system was sufficient to detoxify the smoke of a small cook fire, but it is overwhelmed by the sheer mass of airborne toxins it must currently deal with, and so these airborne toxins have begun accumulating in our bodies. Let's move on to the next type of toxin, chemicals. The only chemicals pre-industrial man was exposed to would be found in the plants he would eat. Plants have various defenses against being eaten. Some plants, like cactus, develop sharp spines as a deterrent. Others manufacture chemicals that make those who ingest them sick. Cooking would often destroy or dilute these poisons to levels that were no longer harmful. But still, we would need the glutathione system to deal with them from time to time. Today, we are exposed to thousands of chemicals on a daily basis. Each year, an estimated 400 million tons of the 6 to 7 million known chemicals are produced for use in industry. Artificial colors and flavors, preservatives, toxic sugar substitutes, and many other chemicals go directly into our food and drink. The rest of these chemicals eventually find their way into the air, soil and groundwater, and then into our bodies. Again, our glutathione system is overwhelmed, and as a result, our bodies accumulate toxic chemicals. The third group of toxins we will discuss are those that come from bacteria and molds. It may seem odd that we are still dealing with bacteria and molds in the 21st century. After all, refrigeration keeps food from spoiling, so where would we find ourselves exposed to them? Let's look at mold toxins first. 
All the grains, nuts, and seeds we eat are routinely tested for mold toxins, and if they test above a certain level, they are removed from the human food supply. Even with this inspection, our food is often infected with mold toxins at some level. Take any nut, grain, or seed and look closely at it. It probably looks fine, but place it under an ultraviolet light in a dark place and you will often see the telltale eerie green glow given off by mold growing on the food you are about to eat. Animals get even less protection. The feed given to cows, poultry, pigs, and fish are allowed to, and regularly have, extremely high levels of mold toxins in them. Food considered too moldy for human consumption is purchased at a discount as feed for these unlucky animals. Over the animal's life, these mold toxins continue to concentrate in their tissues in ever-increasing amounts. When we then eat these toxic animals, their mold toxins are passed on to us. Through the principle of biological magnification, we often end up with mold toxin levels hundreds of times higher than that of the livestock we actually eat, and thousands of times higher than the moldy food they eat. This, added to the fact that these animals are all massively dosed with antibiotics from the day they are born until the day they are slaughtered. These antibiotics, meant to prevent their cramped and unhygienic living conditions from giving them infections, makes for an even greater mold toxin exposure, as many antibiotics are made from molds. When you include the toxic molds growing in the walls and ventilation systems of most houses and office buildings, you can see that we actually have a significantly greater exposure to mold toxins now than we did 300 years ago. Again, our glutathione system is overwhelmed, and as a result, our bodies begin to accumulate mold toxins. Okay, we've discussed molds. Now let's look at bacteria. Better hygiene has removed most of our bacterial exposure with one exception, and that is the bacteria we carry within our own bodies. It may be surprising for you to learn that there are more bacterial cells living inside your gut than there are cells in your own body. Billions of bacteria live in our mouths, on our skin, and especially in our gut. Now, if you were breastfed as a child and never given antibiotics, then it is likely that your gut is filled with healthy, life-giving bacteria. These good bacteria help you digest your food, and produce useful things like B vitamins and vitamin K. On the other hand, if you have ever taken antibiotics, then you've killed off some of your good bacteria and bad bacteria may be growing in their place. These bad bacteria can secrete toxic waste products, sometimes directly into our bloodstreams, day in and day out for our entire lives.